So the truth of the matter is, before we knew, we ever heard of the Wuhan virus or Wuhan, however you pronounce it, or COVID-19, there was, all, before this virus even became a global pandemic, we were already experiencing a global pandemic called anxiety, okay? And you probably didn't know these specific facts that I'm getting ready to share with you, but you probably won't find them hard to believe, okay? Every year, hear me on this, every single year, 50 million Americans feel the effects of panic attacks, phobias, and other anxiety disorders, and uh, feelings of the chest tightening, you know, feeling dizzy, getting so worked up that you get lightheaded, you know, pass out even. Um, and to be honest, there's something about the culture here in America, like statistically, this is not even just my opinion, but statistically, America is five, has five times more cases of anxiety than any other country. And to, to take that even further, people who move from other countries, other nations, they get here and because of the culture, I believe it's our pursuit of this false idea of an American dream, they take on the anxiety of America as well. And so every single year, America spends $300 billion on stress-related ailments. Because the truth of the matter is, uh, these stress-related, like the stress, anxiety, it does impact our bodies physically. And anybody who, who struggles with anxiety, you can attest to this. It does impact your physical body. And there are several reasons why I think America is, is and just our times today, why anxiety is so pre prevalent. Um, you know, back then, like back in the day, it would take two to three days or a week for everyone to hear of news of a crisis, but due to like social media, advanced technology, we are exposed to crisis after crisis after crisis. And before we, while we're in the middle of processing one, before we even get to the next one, um, before we get to the next one, we're like met with another crisis and we're trying to process this. So we experience even emotional trauma scrolling on social media. Okay. And there's been, I can attest, you know, just me personal testimony, there's been times where I've been, I'm in a good mood, I'm having a good day, I'm clear-headed, have a sense of peace, and I see a story or something, uh, a news headline or something on social media, and it completely impacts and changes, alters my mood, you know what I mean? It, and I'm just going down like the spiral of thoughts. And, uh, you know, I also believe that due to past hurt that we've all experienced, childhood trauma, uh, we project a lot of our past trauma and emotional abuse on possible future outcomes that may or may not happen. Um, because our last relationship may have ended in flames, we get anxiety about the potential future ones. Uh, and when you meet someone that maybe God has pl actually placed in our paths that, uh, that is for us, because we're holding on to past trauma and that the past experiences, it's hard for us to accept what God has for us because we're trapped in this feeling of anxiety. And, and this is anxiety. And, and the, the truth of the matter is that we have actually normalized anxious behavior. We have normalized anxious behavior. It's become a part of our daily thought process, how we act, how we move, how we think, our very actions are heavily influenced by anxiousness. And we're going to dig deep into this tonight. Part of our daily pondering is through the lens of anxiety, how we interact, how we in engage our children, how we decide to raise our children is a lot of times rooted in anxiety. And so before we even dive deep, here's my first point. And we're going to talk about it. I'm going to explain it. My first point is this. Anxiety is trepidation. And I'm going to explain this. Anxiety is trepidation, meaning that anxiety is the fear or agitation of something that may happen. It is a meteor showers of what ifs, okay? It's, it's what if I don't find a better job? What if I don't get that promotion? What if I never meet someone that's right for me? What if I can't afford 
braces for my kids? What, what if I can't? What if I can't go back to school and finish that degree? What if my kids turn out to be the very person I'm trying my best to make sure they don't become? This is anxiety. These are conversations of anxiety. And anxiety is a nebulous hunch about things that may never actually happen. I'll say it again. Anxiety, it's a nebulous hunch about things that may never actually happen. And so the question we're tackling in this series is how can I, how can we as believers, as disciples of Jesus Christ, how can we overcome anxiety in a time in history, society, and culture that seems to shape, that seems to fashion and program our lives to always move, always think, and operate in the realm of anxiety? That's the question that we're going to be tackling. So for those you know who know me, and those who don't, you, you will, I like to define terms, okay? I like to define terms. This is, we're talking about anxiety. I want to actually make sure that we have a clear working definition of what anxiety is. And so the definition of anxiety in Webster's Dictionary is a feeling of worry, nervousness, or unease, typically about an imminent event or something with an uncertain outcome. And there's that word again, uncertain outcome. You're already feeling the effects as if it's already happened, even though it's just a slight possibility that it's going to happen. And so although worry and anxiety are used interchangeably, like those terms, there are some differences between anxiety and worry, okay? Um, We experience worry a lot in our heads, but anxiety we experience in our bodies. You actually literally feel anxiety. It, It causes restlessness. It causes neck pain, stomach pains. It causes high blood pressure, low blood pressure. It it causes regular patterns of headaches. You know, it directly impacts our bodies. You see, but the difference with worry, worrying can, can lead to discussing possible outcomes and solutions, while anxiety prevents us from productivity. It prevents us from making the proper plans and putting the proper things in place. For example, If I'm worried about not having enough money by the end of the month, worry says, let me put something in place. Let me do a plan. Let me get a budget in place so I know how much I need, should spend and how much I shouldn't spend. I know not to go out to eat, not to go out with those friends this week. I know to do certain things. Worry causes us to make plans to overcome worry. But anxiety, it puts us, it paralyzes us from moving forward. It keeps us from productivity. You see, by problem solving, by strategic planning, um, you can overcome worries. But anxiety, it lingers for periods of time. And there's also a difference between anxiety and fear. Okay, and I know these are kind of used interchangeably as well, but there is a difference between anxiety and fear. So, for example, fear, it can be justified. Okay, fear can be justified. We've all been scared or afraid or frightened of something. Fear is that feeling you get when you're hiking or when you're walking and a snake something jump out, you know? And the thing I noticed here, different from Texas and California, that y'all have some big lizards out here. Like in, in Texas, we had some geckos like these, but out here, these things shake bushes when you walk by, these lizards. Like these are some big lizards out here. So fear That's something that you see, it's in that moment, you have a right to be afraid, right? But anxiety is, anxiety is, it says that a snake may be out, a lizard may be out, so I'm not going to, I'm not, I'm not going out walking ever. Anxiety says, I'm not, I'm never going hiking with y'all, I don't care what you say. Um, Fear says, you know, I'm outside with my kids and some, a huge dog runs up. Fear says, let me snatch my kids and rush them into safety as quick as possible. Like, because you're terrified of the dog and what, you know, what possibly could happen with a dog with your kids. So you snatch your kids, you go. Anxiety says, you know what? Because there was a dog out before, I'm never taking my kids out again. Like, we're just going to stay in the house. That's the difference between fear and anxiety. And let me clarify this. Anxiety in itself it's not a sin, okay? And hear me on this. Anxiety in itself, it's not a sin. It's an emotion. Like anger, anger, it's not a sin in itself. 
Um, we are even told in scripture to be angry, but sin not. So anxiety does not necessarily automatically equal sin. Okay. There are some things that God like snatches you out of. There's some things that he delivers you out of at the moment of salvation. There are some things that you can praise your way out of, but there are some things that shouting and a dance can't deliver you from. And hear me when I say this, because there's some aspects of deliverance that come with getting an understanding, an understanding of what it is you're up against, an understanding of what it is that is keeping you bound. And so I believe us talking about this, having these conversations and actually um, talking about the emotion of anxiety, this will help us begin our journey towards mastering the unknown, okay, and overcoming anxiety. And so we all go through things, right? We all go through things. We all have went through things where the emotion of anxiety is inevitable, right? We live in a culture, like I explained, in a time in history where anxiety is unavoidable, right? But I want you to understand this. Although anxiety seems to be unavoidable, the prison of anxiety is optional. Okay, I'm saying that again. Although um, uh, it seems that anxiety is unavoidable, the prison of anxiety is optional. In other words, you have a choice. There is this, I know, in spite of the circumstance, in spite of the situation, you have a choice in what you will submit to in regards to anxiety. Okay? And so, of course, even though, like I said, uh, anxiety is it's not a sin it, in itself, the emotion, uh, the lingering emotion of anxiety can be harmful. Okay? It can be. And anything that is harmful, we know that God, it's not his plan for us. Okay? It's not his plan for his children. But anxiety can be harmful because the emotion of anxiety does lead to sin. I'm not going to say it can lead to sin. The emotion of anxiety lingered, and without dealing with it, it does lead to sin. For example, for some of us, um, how we cope with our anxiety, the, the fear of the, the unknown and the potential outcomes, how we deal with that, sometimes it's by having a dream. Um, it's by, sometimes it's by engaging in sex outside of covenantal marriage. Sometimes it's, it's, it's watching pornography. For, for me, sometimes it's eating. I'll be up, anxiety will have me up baking cookies at 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning sometimes. I'm just being honest with you. I'm cooking 6, 7. I'm talking about big sizes. Okay, I ain't talking about these little things. I'll, I'll roll them up. They get thick, and I put them on that tray. It's 2 o'clock in the morning when I'm getting started. This is because I've laid there for now three hours just tossing in my mind, okay? And, and so you'll find yourself when anxiety lingers, you, you'll find yourself acting out of character, okay? you find yourself doing things that you usually don't do. And, and ultimately, you find yourself all out of sync from the will of God and far away from the character of God. And Jesus says this in Luke 22, 22 and 34. Luke twenty two thirty four. Jesus says, be careful or your hearts will be weighed down with carousing, drunkenness, and the anxieties of life. Jesus says, be careful or your hearts will be weighed down with the anxieties of life. And so the question I have for you is, and it's something I want y'all to truly take a moment and really think about, are the anxieties of this life weighing you down are the anxieties of this life the things that you're going through is it weighing you down and here's some questions you can ask yourself to see are you laughing less than you once did or do you see a problem in every promise do you always assume that something bad is going to happen and and, and literally everything do you assume that the bad is going to happen? And never, do you usually magnify the negative things that's going on in your life and dismiss all that God has done and belittle the blessings that God has given you? If, if so, these, if you've answered yes to any of these, it's a strong chance that you have allowed anxiety to promote from just a mere emotion to becoming a master over your flesh, ruler over your flesh. And so, you may be in a place, you may be in a place where the anxieties of this life 
are weighing you down. Okay. And I know that there are medicines to treat those with severe anxiety, but Paul also has a prescription for us in the verses we just read. Paul, he has a prescription for us as well. And his prescription for anxiety, it begins with a call to rejoice. Okay, so I'm just going to look at this again. Verse 4, Philippians 4 and 4, it says, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. And as you can see down in, um, you know, in verse 6, it says, Do not be anxious. But before, he's making a point about anxiety. But before he gets there, he says, Rejoice in the Lord. Again, I say rejoice. And so, like, I like to look at words. So even in this verse, the preposition, that word I in, in, is really important in this verse. Rejoice in the Lord. It's showing us that this type of rejoicing, it's not based upon current job status. It's not based upon current living conditions or even how well or not your children may be doing. It's not based upon health conditions or diagnosis, but this joy and this verse that Paul is talking about, it's under the direct and control and influence of the consistent nature of God, okay? So Paul says, rejoice in the Lord, in the Lord. This verse, it is an admonishment to rejoice. It is a call, not to a feeling. Hear me on this. This rejoice is not a, to a feeling. This is not a call to a feeling, but it's a call to a place. Rejoice in the Lord. Proverbs 18.10 says this, that the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into it and they are saved. In other words, the name of the Lord is not like the name Nick. It's not like the name Bijan, Antonio, Janae. The name of the Lord is not like any of those things. Uh, but his name is a place. His name is a place. And it's in that place. It's in this name that God reveals himself to his people. It's in that place where I learned that God is not just some distant deity that has nothing to do with his creation like deists believe and other religions, but it's in that place where I learned that God, he is a provider, that God, he is a healer, that he is a deliverer, that he is a way maker. He is truly my peace. It's in that place, in the name of the Lord, in that strong tower that God reveals himself to, him, to his people. And so verse four, this is a call not to a feeling, not to an emotion, but to a decision. It's a call to a decision to stay. And I love the word dwell because dwell means to sit down and remain in this thing. This is a call to dwell in the name of the Lord, in his name. For it's in that place that we become deeply rooted in the confidence that God, he exists. And not just that he exists, but that he is in control and that he is good. And because God is immutable, meaning that he does not change in his nature or in his character because he's unchanging, not because that he's incapable of changing, but because he's consistent in who he is and the nature of who he is. Because God is immutable, if my cause to rejoice is solely anchored in Jesus, then my joy doesn't change with ever-changing situations. My, my joy doesn't change with ever-changing statuses and circumstances that life may bring. So here it is, Paul says, rejoice in the Lord. And you may be wondering, what in the world does this verse have to do with mastering uncertainty? What does this have to do with overcoming anxiety? And that's a very good question. And you see, I truly believe that when we take the time to learn more about this God that we claim that we love, this God that we claim, that we serve, uh, when we take some time to, to truly learn what it means to adore and to fall in love with Jesus, what we believe about him, it shapes our behavior. I'll say that again. What we believe about Jesus shapes our behavior. And uh, what you believe, this is true about anything, what you believe, belief always precedes behavior. Okay, what you believe changes who you are. It changes how you react. It changes how you live. It, your actions, it changes your behavior. It is a, a direct reflection of what you believe about God. I'm going to say that again. How you act, how you live, 
It is a direct reflection on what you believe about God. Belief always precedes behavior. And I believe it's, it's true about our anxiety. Our anxiety, our angst about the uncertain outcomes of the future, it's because of our faulty view of God's sovereignty. And that's the main point of what we're about to dive into tonight is we're going to be dealing with God's sovereignty. Okay. Uh, sovereignty, it is God's absolute perfect control and management of the universe. Okay. He preser preserves and he governs every element. He is continually involved with all created things, directing them to act in a way that fulfills his divine purpose. Okay. Um, now hear me, when I say that God has absolute control of the universe, I do not mean that he is the cause of everything that happens in the world. He's not the cause of everything that happens in the universe. God created us, mankind, in his image, okay, with free will, okay? He created us in his image with free, free will to make our own choices and our own decisions. So the very fact that sin exists today it's because of the decisions that humankind makes, continues to make. So the very fact that we live in such a broken, nasty, wicked, cruel world, it's not because of God. It's because of the evil decisions of humankind. So when, when, when God created humankind, when he created the earth, he created us without sin. And because he loves humanity so much, he didn't create us as robots with no free will, unwilling and incapable to make our own decisions, right? It's not really love if you force your creation to love you. You know, it's, it's all fabricated. It's faith. He created us to be able to make a choice to love him, to make a decision to follow him. God did not create the world that you see today. Sin did. So we got to stop blaming God for the wickedness of, of humankind. And when we experience, when we're on the other end of that wickedness, we're the ones, the re receiving end of that, we have to stop blaming God when God provided every single person a way of redemption and access to a purified heart through faith in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus the Christ. Okay, so when I speak of God's sovereignty, I'm saying that no matter the issue, no matter the circumstance or problem, no matter how these issues came about, no matter what is going on, God is still in complete control and he gets glory even in the midst of the chaos. Okay, and so for a lot of us, our anxiety is birthed when we realize that we really aren't in control. I'll say that again, for a lot of us, our anxiety is birthed when we realize that we aren't the ones in control. And I know culture has taught us that if you pull yourself up by the bootstraps and you never give up, and that you can accomplish anything and everything you want, right? But there are things, and we can all testify to this, there are things that happen in life that you have absolutely no control over. You wanted to finish college when you went the first time around, but some things were just out of your control. You wanted your first business idea to get off the ground, but some things just was out of your control. You had the desire, you had the ambition and the talent to pursue your acting career, to pursue your dance career, and you thought you would be a lot further than where you are today, right now, but some things along the way was just out of your control. And when things are out of your control, and this is a hard reality and truth for us to deal with, when things are out of our control, when things don't fall into place on our timeline, when our planning is tossed to the side by the realities of life, that is when anxiety sets in. And that's why statistically, those who love to be in control, AKA the control freaks, you know, I don't, I don't, I'm not even trying to pick on y'all. I'm just saying like statistically, those who love to be in control are the ones that suffer from anxiety the most. Those who love to be in control are the ones who suffer from anxiety the most. You see, when, when everything is going according to your plans, when, when kids are on the track that you've worked so hard for them to be on, when, when you graduated on time, when you, thought, when you decided that you were going to graduate, when you put in the hours 
of rehearsals and practice and you got the role and the part that you auditioned for, when things go how you planned, it creates a sense of calm for you. It creates a sense of peace for you. When you are getting the results of what you worked for, you experience a false sense of temporary calmness, okay? Uh, when we feel like we are in control, we experience just an element of peace. It's not the peace that surpasses all understanding. It's an element of peace. It's, it's, it's not real. And I'm going to show you how. But because life has a way of teaching us real quick that what we thought we were in control over was really just perceived control. What we thought we were in control over was really just perceived control. Perceived control, and this is something to write down right here. Perceived control creates calm, a lack, but a lack of perceived control gives birth to fear. So when our, our anxiety increases as our perceived control diminishes, our anxiety increases as our perceived control diminishes, as it decreases, goes away. Our, incre our anxiety increases when, when sickness hits someone in your household and it's something that an old household remedy can't fix. Okay, our anxiety increases when the job unexpectedly laid us off and we didn't have a safety net in place to fall back on. Our anxiety increases when our perceived control diminishes. You see, we all want to live in this realm of certainty, right? If I make this much money, I will be able to afford X, Y, and Z. If I go to this school, and I get this degree, I can have this kind of job. If I raise my kids like this, then they will turn out like that. If I had $1 million, I could do this and I can do that. Because we think more money, the more money we have means the more control we have over the outcomes of our future. We feel like having more, having more, having more, it creates a sense of certainty for us. But hear me on this. If you don't hear anything else I got to say tonight, hear me on this. Certainty is a cruel imposter. <laughs> Certainty is a cruel imposter. One could become a millionaire and still lose it all in a recession. One could go totally vegan, right, and still be diagnosed with cancer. You can discipline your children and they still end up a troubled Team. You can use all the hand sanitizer in the world. You can have your face mask on. You can stay in your house, never go out during this time of, of COVID-19. You can do all those things, go to the grocery store, touch something that an infected person touched, and you can still walk away and still get COVID-19. Okay, you can still catch the virus. Like, uh, you can be the perfect spouse and still end up being divorced. You see, when, when we all want certainty, but the truth of the matter is, and here's another good thing to write down, we all want certainty, but the truth of the matter is, the only certainty that we can obtain is the lack thereof. The only certainty you can obtain in this life is the lack thereof. When it comes to these material things, when it comes to the things I just mentioned, you know, that's, that's a true statement. And because the only certainty we lack, I mean, we have is the lack of certainty, we must understand that control is not attainable because control is never ours to take. We, we have to understand that. We have to understand. We must, if we're going to overcome anxiety, we must understand that control is not attainable because control was never ours to take. And I know what society keeps telling you. But the truth of the matter is, God did not call you to take control of your life. He called you to relinquish it. He called you to give up your life and take up the life that he's called you to. He's called you to die to your life, to die to your plans, to die to your agenda and pick up the life he's called you to. And I know I've already been teaching here for a little bit. Uh, but if I could give this first week, this first installment of this series a title, it would be, I'm letting go. I'm letting go. I can't control the world. I can't control the future. I can't control what life brings, 
but I can entrust it to a sovereign God. I can entrust it to a sovereign God. And to be honest, I didn't know if I wanted the title of this lesson, I'm letting go or the shift, because there must come a point in the life of every true disciple of Jesus Christ where you must shift your trust from yourself and your abilities to putting your trust in God. There has to be that shift in the life of every disciple where you take the trust out of what you can do, your own planning, your own skills, your own organization, and you put your trust fully in the hands of God. You see, anytime you rely and trust in yourself, you are bound to anxiety because you are finite. You are limited. There's only so much you can do in your own strength. If the only thing, if the only person I had to trust in was myself, I would never overcome anxiety ever. Peace regarding your future is available to you. I want you to hear this. I don't, I don't care what you've, what you've heard or what you've believed in this whole time. Peace regarding your future is available to you, but not because of you. Not because of the lack of problems, but peace regarding your future is available to you because of the presence of a sovereign king. Mastering uncertainty comes when we lean into the sovereignty of God. You see, when, when everything seems to be going wrong, when, when no matter what I do to prevent it, there always seems to be some family drama, when no matter how hard you work, your manager still seems to go out of his or her way to frustrate you, and when, when everything seems to be going wrong, you can stabilize your soul in the sovereignty of God. When you lay awake at night and you're wondering about the potentials of the future, how am I going to pay for this? How am I going to get over this debt? When you are wondering all of these things, will things ever get better? Will I ever be able to pursue my dreams and passions? Will I ever become the leader that I know God is calling to me, me to be? When you're dealing with that thought and when you're battling those thoughts in your mind, you can stabilize your soul in the sovereignty of God. When you find yourself tossing and turning, thinking about all of the people you know or have heard of, of catching COVID-19 or have died from it, and you find yourself slipping back into that meteor showers of what ifs, what if I catch it, what if my husband catches it, my, my children catches it, what if stabilize your soul in the sovereignty of God. Proverbs 21.30 says, there is no wisdom no insight, no plan that can succeed against the Lord. He is in control. What I'm trying to tell you tonight in so many different ways is that God is in control. And even in those moments where it seems like the plans of our adversary is thriving and winning due to the trials of life, God is in control and he can be trusted. Our problem is that a lot of times we do not leave on the front end with trusting God. We lead with trusting ourselves, trusting in our own plans and agenda. We lead with trusting our own efforts and our own skills, and we find ourselves trusting God as a last resort. After we have exhausted literally every other option, we watch our, and we, after we watch our control completely slip out of our hands and dissolve, that's when we result to finding ourselves back to trusting God. But I want to challenge us to lead, to lead by trusting God first. The one who has the supreme authority over every detail, every intricate details of, detail of the universe. This is why Paul is admonishing us to rejoice in the Lord, because this is the same God whom Isaiah spoke of in chapter 7, verses 18 and 19 in his book. He says, God can whistle for the fly that is in the farthest part of the rivers of Egypt, and that fly will come. God is in control. And I know you may not understand these uncertain times that we are in as a nation, uh, or even in the world. You may not understand why it seems like every time you take a few steps forward, you're taking several steps backward. You may not understand the diagnosis. You may not understand why certain people walked out of your life that you felt like would always be there. You may not understand why you lost your job or why that relationship didn't work out. You may not get it. 
but God's answer to times of trouble and uncertainty has always been the same. I'm going to say this again. God's answer to times of trouble and uncertainty has always been the same. And that answer is this. Heaven has an occupied throne. Whew, thank you, Jesus. Heaven has an occupied throne. The reason why you don't have to pace the floors at night is because our Heavenly Father is still seated. Who Jesus, the reason why you don't have to lose sleep over it, over the what ifs of this life is because in spite of everything you're going through, God is still seated. He's not up in heaven pacing back and forth, but God is seated on the throne. And I'm getting ready to end here. But for my Old Testament readers, in the eighth century, there was a man by the name of King Uzziah. Some say Uzziah, some say Uzziah, I say Uzziah, you know man. There was a king by the name of King Uzziah. He was the king of Judah. And for the very first time, Judah, his nation, had entered a season of peace like never before. And this only came under his leadership. He was not a, a perfect king. You know, he didn't do, always do the right things. There were some mistakes he had, some sins he fell into. But one thing he did very, very well during his reign is he kept the nation's enemies out of the territory, out of the nation's territory very well. He, he reigned as king of Judah for 52 years. He was the most consistent and effective king that Judah had ever seen since King Solomon. His reign was prosperous. And though Judah stayed under constant threat of attack, Throughout his 52 years, King Uzziah kept their nation protected. They never lost a battle while he was king. He covered his people. He protected them. But then something happened. Something happened that would shape the nation of Judah to its core. Something happened that would send shockwaves of worry and anxiety to every woman, every man, and child in Judah. And it is this, King Uzziah died. King Uzziah died. And the first thing that people, that the people of Judah began to think is, how will we survive now that King Uzziah has died? Whew, I'm trying my best not to preach y'all. How will we survive now that King Uzziah has died? How will we keep our enemies from attacking us during this vulnerable state without a king without a leader? And if we bring it to today, these similar questions that we're asking is, what am I going to do now that the divorce is final? What am I going to do now that it seems like I'm raising these kids by myself and I'm trying to figure out how to be both mother, play both role of a mother and a father while working and trying to balance all the issues of life? How am I supposed to do that? What am I going to do now that the, the contract employment has come to an end? And it seems like I have more bills than money coming in. What am I going to do? I'm getting older, but I want to have kids. I want to be married one day, but I just wasted years and years in another toxic relationship that ended in flames. What am I going to do? And in my case, I just moved my family from Dallas to LA with a vision from God. And now months in, still trying to figure out what kind of job situation can work and fits our family dynamic. What in the world am I supposed to do? King Uzziah is dead. Who Jesus, King Uzziah is dead. That's what the people of Judah were talking about. Those are the type of questions they were wrestling with. But then the prophet Isaiah, Jesus, the prophet Isaiah, he came on the scene, and this was at the beginning of his prophetic ministry. And although you could see families mourning in Judah, although you could see chaos wreaking havoc in Judah, Isaiah said in chapter 6, verse 1 of his book, in the year that King Uzziah died, I know what everybody else saw, but I saw the Lord high and exalted. Oh, Jesus, I saw the Lord high and exalted. And better yet, to take it a step further, I saw him seated on a throne. And I know what your economy may be looking like today, but take heart. Take heart because the king is still seated. I know you may have angst and anxiety about the emotional health of your children, about the health of your parents, but the king is still 
seated. Uzziah's throne was empty, but God's throne has always been occupied. Uzziah's reign ended after 52 years, but God's sovereign reign is from everlasting to everlasting. Although Isaiah, Isaiah had plenty reason to worry, he had plenty reason for anxiety about the uncertain future that lied ahead of Judah. God did not calm Isaiah's fears by removing him from the situation. Hear me on this. God did not calm Isaiah's fears by removing him from the situation. He didn't calm Isaiah's nerves by wiping out all of Judah's enemies. And I know based on my own personal testimony that most of our prayers to God are, God, get me out of this. God, fix this, right? God, snatch me out of this situation. Snatch them out of my life. Father, erase the debt. <laughs> you know, take it away. Pay it in full. Whatever you got to do, take it away. Remove the boss. I don't care how. Remove the boss that runs me low every day. Take it away. Because we naturally think that removing the nuisance is what's best for us. But God did not calm Isaiah's nerves about the death of Uzziah by removing everything that caused worry. But hear me on this. He removed his fear by revealing his sovereignty. Whew, thank you, Jesus. God removed the fear of Isaiah by revealing his own sovereignty. He removed the fear about the future by revealing his divine power and presence. He removed Isaiah's fear about the future by showing Isaiah that he was still seated on the throne of heaven. And so the question I want to leave you with tonight, the question I want to leave you with tonight is will you continue to trust the throne of your own will the throne of your own desires? Will you continue to trust in the throne of your own agenda? Or will you shift your trust to the occupied throne of heaven? Will you shift your trust to the occupied throne of heaven? And so tonight, what God is saying to each of you who's on this call right now, what God is saying is if you are tired of being stuck if you're tired of being paralyzed and trapped and imprisoned, enslaved to anxiety, if you are tired of living through the lens of anxiety, if you're tired of making every decision based on the what ifs of this life, God is saying tonight to relinquish your control and to trust in the sovereignty of God. Relinquish your control and trust in the sovereignty of God. And that's a hard thing to do. That's a scary thing to do. Because, you know, we usually pray this thing, God, Jesus, take the wheel, but only in the moments that we want him to. But to say relinquishing the reins, it's saying, I'm, get, I'm all in this time. I'm giving it all up. Yes, truly to your will. Yes, truly to your way. And, and trusting in God, hear me on this, trusting in God looks like rest. R-E-S-T, trusting in God, it looks like rest. And it just, for me, it just paints this beautiful picture when, when Jesus and the disciples was traveling across the Sea of Galilee and that the storm was there, the disciples was tripping, they was scared, they was afraid, anxiety, worry, you name it, but Jesus was sleeping. And that is the beautiful picture of what true peace looks like. And the reason why Jesus was able to sleep is because he knew who was in control of the storm. I thank you, Jesus. He knew who could say, peace be still, and every, everything has to come under subjection to his sovereign will and to his power and to his authority. And so what God is saying tonight is if you're ready, if you're tired of feeling like this, relinquish your control. Give God your yes. Give God the, the, the yes that he's been wanting from you for a long time. Give God to relinquish your control and trust in the sovereignty of God. Because whatever is happening in your life, whatever situation you're facing with, all the childhood trauma that so many of us have, all the childhood abuse, sexual abuse, you name it, all those things, if God allowed it, it's because he intends to use it. And, when God, and that's the thing about God's sovereignty the devil may have caused certain things. The enemy may have did certain things, but God, because he's in control of all, 
because he's sovereign, because he's all powerful, he can use what the enemy tried to do and he can use it to work in your favor. And for you to use that, God is, God is going to, for, for some of the mess we've all been dealing with, God is bringing us to, he's going to allow us to minister to people from that same area, from that place of pain, from that place of hurt. There's a ministry that God is calling to from that very place. But now he's saying, what I need from you is your yes, is your yes. And so what I want us to do real quick all together, I want you to just take a few minutes right now um, and pray. And I want your prayer to be, because I don't want to just, I don't want to just, uh, to, to pray over you about this, because this is something, this is, this is a thing that you have to walk through. This is a decision you have to make. So what I want you to do right now is, is to, to just begin praying, just begin to calling out to God and say, Lord, I'm tired of doing things my way. Father, I'm tired of carrying the weight of being in control. And the reason why this is so heavy is because we wasn't meant to carry. We wasn't meant to go through life as if we were the ones in control. So tonight I want you to just cry out to God and say, God, I'm giving you my yes this time. It's not going to be like the last time. It's not like the last time I was in some church service, some conference, and I came down to the altar. But God, right now in my room, right now where I'm at, I'm giving you my yes. And Father, I mean it this time. Take, take every ounce of anxiety away, Lord God. Help me to trust in you. That's what our prayer should be. Father, help me to shift the trust from my own abilities and help me to trust in you, Lord God. The one who can do far greater than what I can do. The one who, has, uh, who owns the cattle of a thousand hills. The one who is sovereign, Lord God. Help us to shift our trust in you. Take away every ounce of fear, Lord God, unhealthy fear. Take it away, Jesus. Father, help us to trust you one day at a time, one decision at a time. And Father, well, I'm just grateful because you are concerned about every detail of our lives, not just the things that we consider big, but Father, you even want to get down into the very intricate details of our lives, Lord God. Help us to open them up to you, Jesus. Help us, Lord God. So I want this to be, to be your continual prayer. Like, as we're going through this series, I want this to be your prayer. To God, help me shift my trust in myself. Because I'm tired of letting myself down. I'm tired of letting you down, trying to do it my own way. But Father, take this away from me. Help me to trust you like I've never trusted you before. That should be our continual prayer.